media has become, has evolved into big business. Um, Sivia, you've done a lot of different things, and we first connected because of a project you did on the whole issue of choice and abortion and the loss of those rights. And um, I want you to talk a little bit about yourself to set that up and then tell us a little bit about that project, and then we can get into an interview. But I need people to know about this, and I'd rather have you explain it. Right. Well, I have spent my career as an investigative journalist. I was a foreign correspondent at the end of the Vietnam War, and then I was an investigative journalist, first in print, Time Life Publications, Time Inc., and then ABC News, and then an executive at CNN. And I have always focused as a journalist on connecting the dots, which is what investigations do. So I did actually um, do the first exculpatory DNA case in the US and um, actually was able to get two people off death row through investigations. So I also am a product of the 60s and I was an activist in the 60s and I was in the streets marching, protesting for women's rights. Mm -hmm. And like everybody else, I thought that we had attained our goal. We had attained voting rights, made abortion safe, legal, and available. We had attained some form of gender equity, not entirely, but we had made progress initially with our ERA, even though it never was fully ratified. So I, like so many people in my generation, went on with our lives thinking that the goals we had attained, once you climb the rungs of the ladder, you're not going to fall backwards. It was the Hobby Lobby decision in 2014 that stunned me mm. and made me wake up to what was happening. I could not understand how contraception could be viewed as an abortifacient, as an instrument of abortion. I mean, obviously you wanted contraception to prevent unwanted pregnancies, to reduce the need for abortion. Hmm. So a number of people said to me, how did this happen? I was wondering, how did this happen? And I began to investigate this. And I realized there was a need for the public to become aware of what had happened. Hmm. So I ended up producing and directing a film called Birthright, A War Story, which is not about abortion per se, it's about the collateral damage, the dangerous effects of the war against reproductive rights mm. and access to the full spectrum of reproductive health care. Mm. Now, I saw that film, and of course, there was nothing new there in one sense for me, because I have followed this story very closely for other reasons, as you well know, that back in the 1970s, when you were well, 60s and 70s, but in the early 1970s, when you were rightly protesting first and then was an activist for women's rights, I was on the other side of the issue with my father, Francis Schaeffer, who was a religious right leader. We made a film series called Whatever Happened to the Human Race with Dr. C. Everett Koop, who became a Surgeon General under Ronald Reagan. And sadly, the result of that series was to do something that up till that point hadn't happened. And that was put a lot of evangelical leaders like Dr. Billy Graham, Dr. Criswell of the Southern Baptist Convention on the spot because they in fact were, believe this or not, for people watching who didn't know this history and weren't there as I was, they were pro-choice. So when we came out with an anti-abortion film series and an anti-woman film series, we called it family values. It was thinly veiled misogyny is all it was, really. Right. Exactly. But the amazing thing was that back in the early 1970s, just as Ronald Reagan had legalized abortion in California as a Republican, we as evangelicals were surprised to find when we got on the anti-abortion bandwagon that a lot of our opposition was coming from other evangelicals. And we had to steamroller them, and we did. 
The editorial board of Christianity Today magazine refused to endorse our series. Dr. Billy Graham, the evangelist, would not get involved. Dr. Criswell called himself pro-choice. Well, actually, he said, I believe that women have a choice. The term pro-choice wasn't really coined at that point. So sadly, what we did is we helped politicize the religious movement of the evangelicals. And of course, now you fast forward some 40 years to the present, and we're through the Trump presidency, and the same kind of people we politicize now are taking a, quote, Christian stand on not wearing masks, not getting right. vaccinated, anti-science across the board, denying climate change, all the rest of it. Sadly, I see the journey from the other side. So the first thing I want to say seriously to you face to face is I am so sorry <laughs> that I was on the other side of this right. issue. And I have spent the last better part of 35 years trying to do something to right that wrong, having come to my senses as I got away from that nepotistic relationship I had with my dad. And the second thing is, is I, I want to make sure that people are aware of the movie you made and we're going to put links to it and to you and everything else um, and how to get in touch with you. So all that said, the next question I have for you is very straightforward. Given the fact that Amy Coney Barrett is now on the Supreme Court and interprets religious civil liberties as, for instance, not allowing companies, not forcing companies to respect women and provide uh, funding through insurance for contraceptives, what do you think happens next? Where are we going with Roe, abortion rights, all these state initiatives? Just paint a picture for us because I think you are the expert and I'd like people to hear what you have to say. Amy. Barrett alone does not make the difference. Right. Roe is gone. For all intents and purposes, Roe v. Wade does not exist in this country for the majority of women. Mm. First of all, let me go back and say that we have changed our vernacular. And that was one of the mistakes that we made in the 60s and 70s when we talked about my body, my choice and the pro-choice movement. It's erroneous. If you do not have options, you do not have choices. So many of us have moved away from that terminology and we are encouraging people to talk about full spectrum of reproductive health care. Mm -hmm. It is not a choice if you are poor. It is not a choice if you live in 90% of the counties in the United States where there are no providers. Mm -hmm. And it certainly is not a choice when we have healthcare industries, the insurance industries and hospital corporations denying access, not just to termination, but engaging in miscarriage mismanagement mm -hmm. because there still is a faint heartbeat. So it is not choice. It is a woman's health. It is her life. It is her bodily autonomy. And what we're talking about now is state sanctioned brutalization and torture and enslavement of women. Mm -hmm. And it is indeed the, the real life handmaid's tale because you have the collusion of legislation and court uh, decisions that have created a forced birthing situation where women at the behest of the state are now childbearing. But Amy Coney Barrett alone isn't making the difference. We have had, the film shows that as of 2010, when the group, the politicizing of the issue that you nurtured came to fruition, and particularly in the wake of Obama's election, so all of the racism involved, when the Tea Party took over, the year 2011 saw 89 abortion restrictions, more than in the entire history mm. of Roe. Now, since January, from January to June of this year, in just six months, we have more than we had in that entire year. We have 23 states that have Republican trifectas, and they are passing legislation so rapidly and restricting it. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court decision last June, a year ago, 
when Roberts ruled in the Louisiana case. Mm -hmm. He left the door open because the standard used to be you cannot restrict, states can't restrict if there's an undue burden. Now he elasticized that because he said it must prove a substantial burden. And the states are testing that right and left. So we now have in Texas, a six week ban and vigilante justice because they now are going to pay $10,000 bounties for people who turn in someone who got an abortion or assisted with an abortion or was a provider. We have a Mississippi case, a 15 week ban going to the Supreme Court, but we have restrictions in 43 states. And as I just said, even states that have attempted to protect the bodily autonomy, like Illinois with a, a bill H, HB 40, House Bill 40, which legalizes and guarantees abortion. The fact is one in three beds in that state are owned or operated by Catholic health care. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you don't have access. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the points you were making um, that I want to pick up on, because I think it's an excellent point, is this idea that women and indeed any citizen in the United States have been stripped of real autonomy and real choice. So you say pro-choice as if choice existed. And I think it's more than the, the choice to determine what to do with a pregnancy. If you think about the alternatives that are given, say, to a working uh, mom, right. um, there is no social safety net there to provide a real choice whether to have or abort a pregnancy. If the minimum wage was a real living wage, if there was free medical care, right. if you had social services, for instance, comparable to Iceland or Finland for single women who are pregnant, if you had an education system that allowed you to take time off to have a child come back with no exactly. loss. And the same with an employment system. Where affordable childcare. Affordable childcare and or you could take a couple of years off subsidized by the company and or the government and come back with no loss of position. We have none of those things. So in fact, what we tell people, it seems to me, when it comes to parents, women and or couples and or single mothers trying to start a family is that you are on your own. You have a choice to keep this child or be completely alone with no services and help at all comparable to, for instance, most other Western countries. That to me seems to give the lie to what I would call the fake family values party that I was part of back in the 70s and 80s, which said, this is all about family and values. If it were, those same folks on the Republican right would have been the people spearheading a social agenda of change on all fronts to facilitate parenthood across the board, single, pair bonded, married, gay, straight, non-binary, whatever. There would have been a baseline there for those people. Having not provided that, it's impossible to take anybody's argument seriously on the so-called pro-life side because they have not fought for those things. So I don't think it's just a choice when it comes to abortion. I think it's a culture that has stripped anybody right. of choice when it gets to any kind of family situation. And I don't know how you feel about that. Well, I fully agree. I mean, the hypocrisy here that a yeah. fertilized egg should have constitutional rights yeah. and that the states passing these laws to protect eggs, zygotes, embryos, yeah. fetuses, doesn't care about the health of the person carrying yes. that entity. Yeah. So, I mean, for example, in Arizona, they just passed in the last session an yeah. abortion ban. Yeah. However, they vetoed prenatal dental care, state supported. Yeah. So they don't care. They veto educational funding in all these states. Education's not a priority. The health of children is not a priority. Look what's happening now with COVID with babies on ventilators around the country. Yeah. I mean, the hypocrisy of all of this has yeah. nothing more to do 
with a very narrow agenda. And if I might say, and you were there in the beginning with your mea culpas, it is a collusion between the Christian militia, the white supremacist movement, and the abolitionists, those who are not just anti-abortion, but those who would sanction the murder of abortion providers and indeed the person carrying the pregnancy. Yeah. And I think I think that the other thing that has to be added, because you're completely right in my view about this collusion between the evangelical Christian movement, the conservative Roman Catholics and the others, but I go a step further and say that having come from an evangelical fundamentalist background of the Calvinist strain, that one of the things I was raised to believe is that men are inherently by God's design in charge of women, that patriarchy is built into God's plan. And of course, as long as that's the case, anytime a woman exercises any right of choice, whether it's sexual procreation, career, you name it, she's now flying in the face of what God planned. And so you have all these male leaders with some collusion from women, like say an Amy Coney Barrett, coming in saying, we're defending God's plan for the family, God's plan for relations between men and women. So it goes past just abortion. In fact, abortion is almost a footnote compared to the collusion about the basic God-given right to be a misogynist. And that is where it all gets very difficult because there's no arguing with that because it's a matter of irrational faith. And so basically you're out of the realm of politics and you're into ground, the grounded belief system of an entire fundamentalist interpretation of Christianity, whether it's Roman Catholic or Protestant. And I think that people on the secular side often have missed the point uh, when it comes to how Trump got elected and so forth, that by the time you get into this, this region of religion, this is how God made things. Argument, facts, none of this matters, because at this point, you're dealing with people who deny science anyway across the board, right. as you see with right. climate change. And this is another instance of that. And I don't know, I mean, I obviously you're aware of what I'm talking about, but I just wonder how you would feel about that. Well, I mean, you're absolutely right. This is all an attempt, you know, vis-a-vis Handmaid's Tale, which was so prophetic, to create a theocracy. We definitely are on the road to Gilead here. And in fact, if you saw an ad that the owners of Hobby Lobby took out in a recent newspaper, a full page ad calling for more religion in government. Hmm. This is a a backward step. I mean, this country was founded on separation of church and state. Hmm. And what is most interesting is the distortion of even religious values. You know, I'm amused because evangelical beliefs stem, I mean, Christianity stem, the New Testament stems from the Hebrew Hebrew Bible. Hmm. And in the Hebrew Bible, there is no, the fetuses are recognized in the book of Exodus. It says that if there is injury to a fetus and it dies, property damages are owed, Mm -hmm. not homicide, not murder, it's property, okay? Mm -hmm. And in Judaism, Personhood is not recognized until birth. Mm-hmm. The distortion here is interesting. Catholicism did not prohibit termination of a pregnancy until 1869. And that was when they began to see all the defections and they were afraid of losing you know, their, their congregants to Protestantism, Lutheranism, etc. And therefore, They wanted, you know, be fruitful and multiply to be the tenant here. But it is a, the subservience of women is what has evolved. Mm -hmm. And um, this is part and parcel of it. I mean, I have to tell you, in researching this film, I went back and listened to speeches from your father, Mm -hmm. from Jerry Falwell, Things that even in church, a woman may not speak unless she's given permission to pray aloud. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, so it is certainly the underpinnings of this are misogyny, and it is about state. Now it is state sanctioned mm. control of procreation, but of everything else that has to do with a woman's autonomy. We are in conversation with Sivia Tamarkin, who is a feminist and leader, I guess I should say, in the pushback against the religious right, but also the entire misogynist movement we now are caught up in, trying to take rights away from women that Sivia was saying back in the 70s when Roe was passed and some other things happened, we thought was behind us. Um, I want to also pause to say that this is In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. You're watching this on Facebook Live. It's also a podcast. If you miss some part of this or you know someone who should be listening, please like the page. Please share it. Uh, what Sivia is saying is vital information. <clears throat> now, I have a question for you, Sivia. Um, what is it about secular commentary since you're a journalist and you've done this for a long time and you've seen this whole thing? So I'm going to ask you a question. It seems to me that it's been self-evident for 40 plus years that the religious right was doing exactly what you're talking about. And that is angling for an end game of theocracy. And yet when you look at the reporting in the New York Times and other places on say the election of Trump, it's all the Rust Belt, steel mills shutting down, people in Appalachia. You would think that religion doesn't exist in this country. You know, the Times has a style section, no religion section to explain any of this to anybody. Right. Once in a while, you get an article. What is it? And this is literally not a rhetorical question. I'm asking you because you're a journalist. And if anybody knows, it's going to be you. Why have, for instance, I been for the last 30 years trying to warn people saying what we're talking about right now is coming. And it's always like I'm from another planet. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's all the GDP and it's lo it's loss of factory jobs, anything but to discuss honestly what conservative evangelicals have been doing with reconstructionism, with trying to build all these theocracy movements. The Federalist Society have a checklist of people they want on the bench to defend religious liberty at the expense of all other liberties. Even say being able to meet against COVID restrictions without masks and become super spreaders in churches. Why don't the secular media, if I can put it that way, where have they been in explaining this so we don't wake up when Hillary Clinton loses and say, what the hell happened here? But someone tells you what's actually going on, that once Trump got this group, he had something pretty hot pushing him along. Where is the systematic explanation of the far right, religious right, and the theocracy movement in what I would call the prestige media that would then percolate down to other levels. I still don't see it, even now. It doesn't. We don't see it. And there are many reasons for this, sadly, as a lifelong journalist, very sadly. Mm. Um, I say that there is a confluence of forces here. Media has become, has evolved into big business. Mm. You no longer have you know, they're owned by huge corporations. So you have ABC owned by Disney, you have CNN with Time Warner, you have, um, you know, huge newspaper chains. Now we have lost the local independent press for the most part, for the most part, some exist. Number two, it is so they are afraid to alienate hmm. an entire religious potential reader constituency. Secondly, we now live in this digital, fast-paced, moving news, breaking news. Everything is breaking news constantly. And so there is less of a tendency, except through some long documentary projects, et cetera, to do what, or series like the 1619 project that the New York Times had, to do what we used to in my day call thumb suckers. You know, you mull it over, you massage it, you analyze it, you put it in context. Mm. There's no time for that because there's breaking news all over the place. And we do not see journalism that does cause an effect anymore. It is just what is happening, what is happening now, yeah. shift on to something else. I mean, look how fast we go from topic to topic. Mm. At the same time, 
when information surfaces, there is a feeling, okay, we can't sit on this too long. We're going to lose our readers, our viewers, our you know, consumers here. I like to draw the comparison to what happened only yesterday. In 2006, Inconvenient Truth came out, mm. the film by Vice President, former Vice President Al Gore, warning of the consequences of climate change. Mm. Only yesterday, the UN issued a mm. dire report saying it's too late that for the next 20 years, heat, fire, floods, drought, starvation are going to reign. So people do not, you know, something is revealed, it's, it's explosive, it's the headlines, and people move on. When our film first came out, and it's still out on digital, but when it was first in theaters, we were issuing a call to arms. We were issuing a warning. We were saying, look how the religious right has mobilized, strategized, built exactly um, their war plan, their game plan, and we need to act. People did not take to the streets at the time, and now look where we're at. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great explanation, and I would take it even a step further and just say that philosophically speaking, you know, we know, you and I know something about the human race, just as we don't do long-term planning very well on the environment, because it boggles the mind. You know, we don't think very long-term as humans. That's not how we evolve. Well, similarly, when you tell people, hey, you know, put your head to the rail, put your ear on the rail and listen, something's coming. Um, if it's too far out, they don't want to hear about it. And if it takes a little complexity and thinking, it's hard to contemplate so that when you're warning about environmental catastrophe or economic catastrophe, if you keep going in a certain direction, or you were saying, you know, there's this group of people and one of these days they will show up and suddenly this, the Capitol gets stormed on January 6th and there, a lot of these folks are doing it in the name of Jesus and they want to hang the vice president right. who's an evangelical, but he's not evangelical enough for them. Suddenly it's like, oh, where did all these guys come from? But it's always a day late and a dollar short. And unfortunately, that just seems to be a pattern. And I, I, I wonder if folks realize, for instance, that the leaders like Rusas Rashtuni and to some extent, my father with his Christian manifesto, who called for the overthrow of the US government, if Roe could not be overturned by democratic means, then we had to use other means. He said anything was legitimate up until including what would have been legitimate to overthrow Hitler. So imagine the boundary that sets uh, in terms of changing the US government if they don't go your way. Then suddenly there's all these militia groups running around with guns. Right. Now we have anti-vax groups that are, are uh, the militia groups are showing up in support of them. Um, it, it seems to be going through the roof, but you, you know, just like you can take away the Russians and Trump might still be president, you can't take the evangelical white community out of this and have Trump president. You can't take them out of this and have a really big anti-vax movement. You can't take them out of it and not have arm and have armed militias left. At the center of this is an evangelical culture of theology and misogyny. And I don't think the secular media is ready to say that because it suddenly means that you've got to admit where we really are in the same way they weren't ready to admit what Al Gore was saying was true about what he was saying. I just think they can't make the leap. And I, re I really, I re they were doing a real disservice to us. Well, they're not showing the intersectionality between the racism, the sexism, and the classism that mm. is going on. And that is what has given rise to this white supremacy movement. Yeah. And it's very interesting because you only have to go back to Charlottesville and where tragically Heather Heyer was killed uh, by yeah. the auto. And if you read in the wake of that on Der Spiegel, the digital version of the neo-Nazi newsletter, the editorial said she deserved to die because she was a single white woman who had not fulfilled her obligation to procreate. Mm. So this is not about procreative liberty. This is yeah. about procreative duty here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's where we get into this distorted theology. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it's a rationale. It certainly is anti-science. Of course, we recognize that there is no such thing as a partial abortion. Mm. And yet the media doesn't call that out. The media will say a heartbeat bill was passed at in Texas, a six week bill. There is no heart at six weeks. There is no heartbeat. There are nerves that are growing that give off electrical impulses where the heart will develop. Mm -hmm. But this has not been clarified in the media. They have an obligation to point to truth. Mm. And I personally, and I was an executive at CNN, and I, I, as I said, spent my career as a journalist. We understand fairness, but there is no balance or should not be balanced between truth and fiction. Mm -hmm. You do not have to, every time I would see over the past years, have a climate denier on when you have somebody talking about climate change and the hazards and disaster of what's impending. Why? Yeah. There's fiction and there's truth. Hmm. In that debate, it seems to me that we haven't been well served by the digital age where Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Google also have this have had until recently until they really got their fingers burnt. Now they're pulling back a little this idea that somehow all speech is good. And if this person says this, we can let other people balance it with that. Right. You know, this has resulted in genocidal movements in, in, in Asia, where Facebook has been an organizing principle. This has resulted in uh, the anti-vax movement. And right. now I, I'll just share something with you that's very ironic here. It's also resulted in the fact that as they panic because they get so much criticism, and people like Google try to retool their algorithms, it means that the catchwords they use, even if you were using them correctly, suddenly um, get uh, post banned. So for instance, let's say they're looking for anything about vaccine because that's um, being used by anti-vax misinformation. Suddenly someone saying vaccines are okay, that word suddenly either knocks you off or uh, gets right. it noted or whatever. So it, it seems to me that with the, you know, for all its, for all its failings, the mainstream media that you were part of with CNN, Time Magazine, Newsweek, uh, back in the day, and then the New York Times, Boston Globe, and so forth, at least there were, there, there were gatekeepers who were awake right. and alive and human. Now we've got all these algorithms. It doesn't even work when you're trying to say the right stuff because they're not smart enough to build an algorithm right. to tell the difference. So I don't think social media has helped any of this process at all. There's, in a way, there's almost less information available than there used to be when there was just a newspaper relying on your doorstep. Well, there's less accurate. There's a plethora of content. Sure, content's not information. Though. But it's not information and it certainly isn't factual. Yeah. And that's the problem. And people, you ask them, where did you hear this? I heard it on social media. I yeah. heard it on the media. And you have all these independent outlets that are calling themselves news outlets. And going back to what we said, this country does not value education in the way other countries do and the way we used to. Yeah. And so you have a very uninformed public. Hmm. And they seize upon anything that they come across on any platform and believe it's truthful. Yeah, you're, you're, you're watching uh, and or listening to In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. We are talking to Sylvia Tamarkin, journalist, uh, documentarian, filmmaker, feminist, activist. Um, when you look at where things are now, not only on the issue of choice and, and women and rights and health care, but a wider picture of this, this sort of semi-educated to uneducated public getting information in bits and pieces, if you can call it information off the internet. Um, very few editorial gatekeepers anywhere now that say, well, wait a minute, we, we've got to reread this article and, and fact, you know, remember those old words, fact checking. Right. I mean, where's that all gone? Um, how do you see this playing out? I mean, we've, you know, Trump was the reaction to Obama. We've got Biden now trying to do something decent. The Supreme Court has tilted in favor of the far right. 
how do you, Sivia, see this playing out? Not simply the choice issue and women's issues, but the whole package. Where are we headed? Environmental well, issues and all the rest into it. How do you see this? Sadly, I think it's dire. I mean, I fear for my grandchildren. Yeah, me too. But the only hope we have hmm. is to fight back at the polls, to fight back with the vote and not allow voter suppression laws come into effect. I mean, hmm. the young people, the new, newly um, eligible voters need to come to the fore. This is their world. It's not yours or mine. Yeah. This is their world. They need to stand up. They need to stop being so um, self-centered. They need to lose this sense of entitlement. And I don't mean that critically. I think, as I said earlier, they feel entitled because when you grow up believing you have the right to vote, you grow up believing you have the right for upward mobility in many situations, um, legal safe abortions. And then you discover that the rug is being pulled out from you. They need to discard this sense of complacency and entitlement mm. and take to the streets to bring change or it's it's too late. I mean, the environmental report said it's too late now. Mm -hmm. Well, 2022 will determine what is happening in the direction of this country. Mm, yeah. And, you know, the same folks who have been attacking women's rights are the same people. It's exactly the same cohort have been the people taking funding from the oil companies and others to deny right. climate science. It's all the same people. And it, it intersects with the anti-vaccine movement, too. And the and QAnon and all the rest of it. You know, I had a very instructive experience back in the late 1980s. Uh, my wife and I, and we took our, our three kids with us at the time, lived in South Africa for a year at the end of the apartheid era. And I was over there on a filmmaking project. And one thing I don't think a lot of Americans, again, in this entitlement feeling of, oh, well, it'll always be this way and we have these rights. You know, a tiny minority of white people ran that country and suppressed black people for decades. Right. And people tell me, you know, when I talk about the religious right, they say very comfortably, well, you know, this is an older cohort, they're gonna die off. Look at the demographics of who watches Fox News. And what I, what I tell them is, first of all, you're kidding yourself. They're bringing a lot of young people with them through the homeschool movement, feeding into Christian schools, Christian colleges and all the rest who are being indoctrinated. So dream on if you think it's just old people. But let's say for a minute it was that the, the, the the timeline for them doesn't look good. Do you realize that with voter suppression and gerrymandering and now being willing to even question national elections and try to call them null and void and organize to do so if you don't like the result, that it's perfectly possible to envision a future in which a, a white supremacist oligarchy is essentially controlling our political process non-democratically and are we going to wake up to that and understand that if we allow this voter suppression to keep going the way it is, that all this entitlement you were talking about goes right into the realm of literally right. having our vote taken away? That's a real possibility. I don't know how you feel about that. Well, I'm terrified. Um, we just saw over the weekend when there were closed hearings in the Senate hmm. over Donald Trump's attempt to pervert the election mm. to stage an ersatz coup by having the collusion. First, he went to the courts for he went to well, he first he went to the secretaries of state and the governors in and then he went to the courts and then he went to the Department of Justice and he went to, you know, the attorney general asking them all to lie about the results. Mm. Now, you know, fortunately, the attorney general resigned. There were some people who stood up, but we came so narrowly close to having a coup in this country. And yet, as that information is coming out, hmm. people still support him, and if not him, his agenda hmm. and his lies. So I am so fearful of what is happening. Democracy in this country is so tenuous. Mm -hmm. 
And it's not just about rights to bodily autonomy, the right to love and live with whomever you choose or marry. No, it is fundamental. It is, this was a country, as I said, founded on separation of church and state. And Donald Trump is the vehicle by which this extremist agenda is being realized. You know, it's very interesting because Donald Trump himself, one would think, is the antithesis of everything that the evangelical movement stands for. I mean, his, his sexual conduct, his corruption, his lies, his deceit, his financial, you know, entanglements, let's put it this way. Well, not the only fraud. that, end, endless fundraising and then misspending those funds. He's right. saying on I mean, the lies account. and corruption, the lies yeah. and corruption, the deceit. I mean, it goes against every one of the Ten Commandments for God. Thou shall not steal, thou shall not, you know. And yet, because there's an agenda, they are blinded. They turn the other way. They're not blinded, but they turn the other way because what I always say is ever since 19, since your father and Jerry Falwell, you know, since this late 70s, um, jumped aboard here, there has been an agenda hmm. and they have kept their eye on the ball. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to remind you all that you're watching In Conversation with Frank Schaefer, and I am talking today uh, with an amazing person, great insight, but also uh, a lifespan of activism that gives her the facts, speaking of facts, and, and that is a journalist and filmmaker, Sivia Tamarkin, director of a film that's very important, Birthright, a war story, which you can find links to on our page, uh, and you need to watch that and make sure people do. Um, Following what you're saying and, and, and moving on, it seems to me that, that part of this move towards theocracy that you were talking about earlier has to do with something. You were talking about Trump. Uh, um, the only reason Trump got elected is the white evangelical vote plus some conservative Roman Catholics and a few other people. That said, another aspect of why he got elected is that being a lazy con artist, he had no real ground game. And Ralph Reed, the evangelical activist and Franklin Graham, went to him in person and said, look, we have a ground game. It's called crisis pregnancy centers and evangelical churches. You don't have anybody to knock on doors, but we do. Here's the checklist of the people we want appointed. The only consistency with them is that they are all anti-abortion and anti-woman and anti-choice. If you follow this Federalist Society checklist and you do what we want on these issues, we will give you the ground game. I happen to know this is true because I know the people who were involved with this peripheral to Franklin and Ralph, both of whom, by the way, got into politics because of my father's box. Ah. And, and in the case of Franklin Graham, far to the right of his own evangelist father, Billy Graham, right. who, as I mentioned before, was, uh, was pro-choice and wouldn't take quote, a stand with us back on our film series, Whatever Happened to the Human Race. But my point here is that not only did evangelical voters put Trump in the White House, it was evangelical leaders who allowed him to use their 501c3 nonprofit <laughs> churches and organizations that are supposed to be about evangelism and other things to actually go door to door for him and become his ground game yes. and provided him with the presidency. That same group are the ones that polls show, 70% of whom do no longer accept basic democracy because they challenge the election result, believe his big lie that he won. That same group is the, is the cohort that is the heart of the anti-vaccine movement because it has become politicized. Right. It's not just anti-science, but now it's their thing along with no masks and so forth. When you look at this, you realize that um, there is no bottom line below these, which this group won't fall. They will attack our democracy to try to keep power. They will, they will attack children, speaking of pro-life, and put them in the hospital, denying them access to schools where all the teachers have been vaccinated and so forth and so on. I gotta tell you, me personally, me personally, who's always been predicting something, some bad ending here with this evangelical movement, I have been shocked. 
I thought there were still some lines below which it wouldn't fall, no. but there are none. So the only limit these folks have to what they will do to the rest of America is what they think they can get away with at any given moment. That's it. It's purely pragmatic. And I don't think, I don't think that I'm wrong in that. I wish I was. No. no. And it goes way back. You see, I mean, where do you then draw a line in terms of your beliefs, your morality, your convictions. Mm. You know, you as you said, the, the film is not new to you because you were part of the cause, the problem that created this. Yeah. But in the film, when we depict, and I this was a film that was made for the younger generation so they could connect the dots. Right. When you have a minister who is head of the army of God saying on camera, it is okay, you can murder an abortion doctor. Mm. So you can bomb a clinic. You can do all of this as Operation Rescue did. Mm. Um, and you can be an upstanding Christian at the same time. Mm. And what about, let's, let's not, you know, go off point here. Uh, let's go off point with, with, you know, not forgetting the slavery movement. Yeah. And the whole, you know, religious fervor behind that. And so we're talking about the confluence of all of the biases, as I said, from racism to sexism to classism. I mean, poor black women deserve to die mm -hmm. at the rate of, you know, double the rate that white women do in this country. And you earlier made the point how other um, countries have far more advanced systems protecting women's health, childcare, families, et cetera. The US has the highest maternal mortality rate in the developed world. Mm -hmm. Women are dying, two to three women die every day and women of color, the rates are double and triple mm -hmm. because we don't care as a country about health. If yeah. we cared about health and welfare and well-being of the public, mm -hmm. we would not have this ridiculous divisiveness over wearing masks. Yeah. You would not have the governor of Florida threatening to withhold the salaries of educators who want to protect children in schools by mandating masks. Yeah, and it would seem to me we would have basic things like, for instance, parental leave for males, females, non-binary people right. that would set a baseline saying, hey, if you do want to have a family or a child, we happen to be on your side. And none of that has happened. And so, you know, um, I'm hoping when people look at uh, Birthright, A War Story, which is the film that you made, that um, if they are so moved to share that and see that other people are watching it. Do you have any ideas on how we can, you know, make this uh, something that gets seen, give it a whole nother life, get this thing out there again? I know that we're going to give links to it and so forth, but what ways can we, can we really uh, revitalize that movie? Because it's a powerful statement and just start with people looking at that and the discussions it would generate. What are the forums in which that can happen? Well, the movie is on digital platforms. The movie is on educational platforms, Canopy. It's available in most universities. Mm. Women Make Movies is a distributor. Gravitas is a distributor. You can contact them. Um, we have a website, Birthright of War Story. We are on Facebook. Mm. Um, if somebody would like a like me to speak at a screening, even if it's a small group on Zoom gathering, I'm certainly willing to do that. If you go to our website, you can request that. So uh, birthrightfilm.com is the website. Yeah. And we need to get the discussions going. We need young people to start having screening parties. Um, you can do it you know, digitally. You can do it in small groups in homes if you're vaccinated or even if you're wearing masks. Uh, but the discussion has to be revived because yeah. it shows how all of this evolved. You know, one and point we I wanna, see where it's going. Yeah, one point I wanna come back to, cause you, you said it quickly, but I hope that those who are 
watching here in conversation with Frank Schaefer, with Sivia Tamarkin, who made this incredible film, Birthright, A War Story, has offered to be part of your screening. You know, in the same way that as an author, I offer to do Zoom right. book clubs. If, you, if people will, I, I don't think you understand that when you get to someone like Sivia, this is from the heart, this is real. We're, you know, Sivia is not selling you something. She's telling you that you can book her to speak in a Zoom form or in person perhaps, and have her part of this discussion. There's a lot of knowledge uh, that Sivia okay. has here and experience both as a top fight journalist and someone who worked at CNN, who knows this subject, please, those of you who are watching this uh, or listening to it as a podcast, go to our site, which has all of the links that Sivia is talking about. We want you to contact her. We want you to take Thank you. advantage of this because there aren't very many people walking around. As someone who was there in the day, this arc of history is in a few older people's heads, older being experienced and know what they're talking about. And from a journalistic background, I think the, the amazing thing about you, Sibia, is a lot of people come to this fight from various backgrounds, but you come from this analytical, journalistic, writerly background that actually can put forward the facts. Not only were you there, but you have thought about this and thought about it and thought about it, not just for your film, but for your writing. I really want people okay. to take advantage of your offer. So I'm, I may have belabored that point, but Sivia offered to be well, part of you. your thing. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. No, it's significant to look at the facts. It is significant to look at the agenda. Hmm. For example, let's look at criminalization of pregnancy. For group that is proclaiming family values. Hmm. Why would you lock up pregnant people for conduct that they engage in? Hmm. Why would you put out a bounty on a woman who may terminate or a provider who may terminate when that person may have three other children at home and is terminating because the family can't afford to have a fourth? Why are you locking up, as Alabama has, over 600 pregnant women who tested positive for, for drugs during pregnancy when, in fact, they need health treatment, not incarceration, not removal from their families or from the infant they may deliver in prison? Mm. There is no sense of well being here. This is all about an agenda and the perversion of child endangerment laws to create a body of jurisprudence that establishes the personhood of a fetus or a zygote or an embryo. It's all part of this agenda and it is a violation of so many constitutional rights. Mm. But we are looking at issues here. Criminalization of pregnancy is a big one because it is another arrow in the quiver here. Mm. And so a pregnant woman, uh, there was a case, many of your you know, listeners here may be familiar that over a year or so ago, a woman in Alabama who got into a fight with another woman and she was shot in the abdomen mm. and her unborn child died. She was charged with the murder of her fetus because she provoked the argument. I mean, this is nonsense. Mm. Women who miscarry are suspect and are going to jail because people are questioning whether they induce the miscarriage. So they're afraid to get medical help. And you know, it, it will not, everyone says when Roe goes, we'll go back to the back alley abortions. That's not the case. What you're gonna go back to is not the coat hanger symbol. You're gonna go back to jail bars mm. because women will turn to the internet to try to secure medicated abortions to get the drugs, misoprostol, misopristine, mm. and then that will be a crime because it is not being prescribed by a doctor. Mm. In some states, it's illegal. And so they'll serve jail time. 
rather than, you know, their lives at risk, their lives will be enslaved. You yeah. Know? And you, you were speaking, I, I, we're going to wrap this up in a minute, but I just want to say that you were speaking of the direction towards theocracy and of sort nothing you have said emphasizes it more than what you've been talking about for the last couple of minutes here with a criminalization, not just of pregnancy, but women in that it is the, it is the reclassification of women in our culture as second and third class citizens who suffer all kinds of indignities because they are seen as baby making machines that are supposed to obey men and be subservient to them. And here they got up and said, no, we can have our own sexual lives. We can have our own careers. We can have our own lives. And all of this push to, to criminalize pregnancy and even miscarriage in the cases you're talking about is an attempt to intimidate women into their quote, appropriate role according to certain interpretations of the Hebrew and Christian Bibles by fundamentalist Christians and on all sides of the spectrum in this reconstructionist path right. of trying to have the Old Testament law as interpreted by them rule our culture. And of course, their lie is they say again, as if we were ever there. But this is actually a new thing, because as you say, this country was founded on a separation of church and state. And it, I think what you've just been saying, you know, proves that point in a way more than anything else we talked about, even more than abortion, because it's so shocking criminalization. to the right. sensibility, the criminalization of pregnancy itself is just incredible to me. Well, and that, let's not ignore, first of all, let me qualify that the Hebrew Bible does not sanction, you know, Agreed. does say that uh, the woman's right to bodily autonomy and that the woman's sure. life comes first um, and that the fetus is not a person. I'm but talking let's about not, their interpretation of it. But let, twisted. Right, the twisted, correct. Let's not forget that the state engages, state, the general government, engaged in selective state-sanctioned mm. procreation because we... Our witnesses, too, in the 1970s in California, there was forced sterilization of Latinx women. Mm -hmm. And certainly we know about the forced sterilization of Black women in the turn of the century and up and through the 30s in mm -hmm. South Carolina, North Carolina. So we, you know, have to look at the agendas here and how they selectively fit the ideology of the enforcers. Mm. Yeah, so we're going to wrap things up here. I'll come back to you for a last word. Just a reminder that this is In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. I'm talking with filmmaker and activist and journalist, Sivia Tamarkin, who made this incredible film, Birthright, a war story. I'm asking you to get in touch with her through us in that we will post links everywhere where this shows or is heard. So Sivia, just last word here. Um, tell to me just for a moment about your sort of day-to-day -day activities in life now. Um, what, what, I mean, you're here talking to us, so this is what you do, but tell us a little bit about what you're up to, anything you wanna share, and then we'll wrap this up. Well, I continue to be an activist. Making this film has made me realize that I have to continue speaking out. I mean, my husband teases and says, you know, why is a septuagenarian out there speaking? And I say, because our 25 year old grandchildren are not. So yeah. I continue to do that. I testify in legislature. I testified in the Arizona legislature in opposition to various bills. Mm -hmm. um, I do webinars around the country. I speak to law school students, I speak to university students, I speak to very com various community groups. And all of this is geared toward one thing, mm -hmm. get out the vote, go and vote. That is the only thing that will make a difference mm -hmm. because Roe is going to fall. There's very little doubt about that. It's basically eviscerated anyway. But the Supreme Court most likely will kick it back to the states. So very few people realize the significance of down-ballot voting. You must vote 
in your state legislature. You must vote for your school boards, which are banning sex education across the country and banning curriculum and gagging teachers. Mm. So you need to be active now or it will be like the climate crisis too late. Well, on that note, uh, and prophetic call to action. Uh, we will leave you, Sivia, with a huge thank you from me and the people who will be listening and watching. And again, one more time, please get in touch with Sivia by going to all the links that we will be posting. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for thank a lifetime. You. Yeah, thank you for a lifetime of a good fight and uh, blessings on you, your family, your grandchildren you speak of safety and, and health Thank you. and happiness to you. Thank you so much for all you are doing for the rest of us by getting out there and providing some real leadership here. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to bring this discussion to the public. Thank you, Sylvia.